This week on Kentucky Afield. Have you ever seen an elk fly? Well, they hadn't either. We'll take you through the process of capturing elk with a helicopter and tell you why it's being done. Spin around. Spin around. Yep, 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 yep. Next, we're coon hunting in Owen County with one very excited pup. <laughs> then we visit downtown Frankfort and fill the boat with sauger. Another sauger. It's all next on Kentucky Afield. Yeah, we got one. Sweet. Got muskrat? Yeah. Good job. <laughs> what do you know about that, man? That's a good fish, man. Nice male, small mouth. Healthy, pretty color. Cody, here. Find us one more good pheasant, Cody. As biologists, we, we catch ducks and we place bands on them. And it's just a really excellent place to see cottonmouths. What do you think? Like bull. That was pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Kentucky Afield. I'm your host, Chad Miles. Join us as we journey the Commonwealth in search of outdoor adventure. Deer and elk biologists here in the state of Kentucky use many different tools when managing their herds. And relocation is just one of those tools. But this method of relocation is something entirely different. As part of our 20th anniversary of elk restoration, we follow the sound of helicopter rotors to southeast Kentucky. Gabe, <laughs> you always have a pretty wild and interesting job. It's not always in the office, is it? Right, and you know, we're in the office of some, but we're in the field a whole lot. Tell us what we're doing today. So we're out uh, in the elk zone capturing elk for a relocation process. Uh, we, we, you know, we catch elk and move elk around the zone every year. We added a little twist this year and brought in helicopters. So in the past, you guys have always put up uh, traps and if it snows and it's real cold, you bait them in and you close the door and you bring a truck in, you work them up and you relocate them to wherever. Right. Now you're literally going after them on site and getting them with a helicopter, correct? correct? Correct, you know, the corral traps were working. We all wanted to uh, find a new method, a little bit more that was quicker, mm -hmm. easier for staff and good for the elk. And so helicopter capture is used out west all the time. And uh, we wanted to try it here in Kentucky with our elk herd. So you're doing a couple different things to help transport these animals safely. They're getting down and they're actually netting them. They're hooking them up and then what else are they doing? So at that point they get up, they put a blindfold on them. The mm -hmm. blindfold really calms them down. You know, it's, it's just it kind of takes the stress away. Mm -hmm. They tie their legs together mm -hmm. so they can't flop. And then they put them in this big bag and, and capture bag. Mm -hmm. and it protects them, all their organs and their spine and their neck when they're flying. Put them in that bag, hook them up, fly them to us. So you move them a short distance, you, you locate them, you drop them down on a big, essentially a landing zone. Mm -hmm. You do some work up. What are you doing with these right now? All right, so it's a routine surveillance when we look at all of our elk. Mm -hmm. For our females, we want to check if they're pregnant or not. Mm -hmm. Overall body health, make sure they're in good shape, mm -hmm. nothing, nothing wrong with them. Um, we're checking to see how old they are, if they're male or female. Mm -hmm. Female. Um, just just kind of body conditions mm -hmm. and uh, collecting some blood and we'll do a total panel on them just to make sure they're overall healthy. There's a whole lot of reasons you'd want to relocate an elk. I mean, it could be damage, it could be overpopulation, it could be just overall you've got 4.3 million acres right. in the elk restoration right. zone and elk are really clustered in small groups. Mm -hmm. So we've got access to a really large piece of property yep. and we're going to be moving elk over there so that hopefully we'll establish a new herd. Right, and that's something we've done and we found is very successful. You know, we brought all these elk into the release sites and that wasn't didn't cover the elk zone like you said. And now we've, we've found a few new locations where we dropped these elk and now we're to the point where we're protected them and now we're opening them up to hunting. It's really interesting, you think about taking an elk and, and locating it out of a helicopter, that makes sense. Coming in and, and immobilizing an elk, that makes sense, but they're not actually using any type of drugs or medication. This is 100% net 
there's a risk with anesthesia. Mm -hmm. And we know it's, it's very safe and good, but there are complications and there are concerns with it. So if there's a way that we can catch them and not immobilize them mm -hmm. and get them up on their feet and get them out of here, that's what we try to do. And the helicopter capture is a perfect example from on the ground to a new location in a couple hours. So it's gonna be a little bit of stress on the animal, but it's a one day or a couple hours yep. stress. I mean, yep. literally these animals are gonna be maybe a county away or a couple miles away in a new location tonight, they'll be back to normal. Yeah, and one morning they're in one part of the state and the <laughs> afternoon they're in another in a whole new habitat. And you know, we've got collars on them, we're able to track them, make sure they're, they're doing well, where they're moving on the landscape. But you know, it's, it's a pretty quick process for us. This takes a team. This ain't a, this ain't a one or two man show, is no, it? No, no. <laughs> you know, we have a large team, but a very great team. Mm -hmm. And we'll work together. You know, this is all new for us. We've never tried this. We try to talk to our Western counterparts, mm -hmm. get some experience, talking to the company, you know, mm -hmm. what do you need? And we're learning. And mm -hmm. definitely after a couple of days now, we've, we're in the groove, know what we're doing, everybody's got their role. And, and it's, it's good. It's really interesting. I appreciate you letting me get in there and get my hands involved. Not and, a problem. Uh, it's good to see you working in there. Spinning around. Spinning around this yep, time. Yep, 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 yep. Take a second, pay attention to where the door is. Notice yes. this. Don't knock your head off. Don't pop yourself. All right, whatever case you need. Okay, ready? One, two, three. You're dealing with wild animals. Yeah. So there is a little bit of risk involved, but you guys are so professional in how you handle it. I mean, really, you minimize the risk by just doing this over and over and over. Mm -hmm. And you know, you take all the safety precautions you need to for the elk and mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. and that's why they're hobbled, they're blindfolded. You know, that's all proper procedures when you're moving wildlife. And you know, we're taking our, our time and being careful, but also moving quickly. Well, I know they're getting ready to come over that hillside with another animal, so we better get ready and get in our positions. Sounds good. Thanks for giving us Pleasure an update on this. Yes, this is Thank great. You. Running coon dogs is something that can really get into your blood. Let's go out to Owen County and let's find out how a landowner is using coon hunting as a management tool. So we've got three dogs tonight. The first dog we'll hunt is Remy here. She's my oldest dog. She's seven years old, will be eight this summer. I uh, got her from Alabama, uh, raised her from a puppy. And then these two are brother and sister in here and they're about to be eight months old. Oh, wow. Got them from Indiana, so we've been training them. So is that something you like doing? You like starting them from yeah. really young? I have raised somewhere near to five to six dogs from puppies. We actually lost a dog recently. I've got a picture of her right here. Her name was Pig, and we won a lot of competition hunts with her. So she's missed, but hopefully she's here with us tonight. I'd say what, for people who own and run dogs, you spend so much time with these dogs, they kind of become a part of you, don't they? Oh yeah, they sure do. Coon hunting's a family kind of thing, and having these dogs, I couldn't do it without my brothers and my mom and dad, and especially my wife, who really helps take care of them. It's, it's not something that uh, you can just forget about during the summertime and pick it back up when hunting season comes. It's 365 days a year. As excited as you get to get out here and do this, they're more excited. They're way more excited. They would go every night if we could. <laughs> One of the biggest safety things for coon hunting is making sure you have a collar on the dog that has your name and an updated number on it. All right, so we can take her down here just a little bit past the truck and hopefully get a coon treat. She's treed down there, that's her tree bark. You can hear, she's, every breath she's barking. How far away we got now? Well, she's not very far, she's about- Less than 100 yards, isn't Yeah, it? she's about 79 yards in there. All right. I think she thinks she found one, so we can head that way. All right. You said you've had nights out here where you've treated many of 10 coons in a night, huh? Yeah, and we've come out here and went home empty handed, so we'll see what happens here. <laughs> well, that's hunting. shine the tree now and see if we can't find him. Chad, it looks like there's a hole at the top where it branches off up there. Den tree, huh? Yeah. Can't really do anything when there's a hole in the tree. Yeah. We're gonna pull her off there and you're gonna send yeah, her back we'll, out. We'll huh? send her back out. We've got plenty of property to hunt. We will go and try again. All right. Hey, that's part of it, isn't it? That is part of it. Good luck, girl. We're all counting on you.
Remy is so excited about this tree, she's actually chewing on it. <laughs> we can try and squall and see if we can't get him to look. Well, I'm not seeing him in this one either. We'll pull her off and go back out to the road. We'll go to where I proposed my wife. That should be a good luck place because she said yes. <laughs> there you go. That's got to be a good spot. So the Garmin says she's treed, shows her the direction she's in uh, at about 79 yards. Nice and close. Let's go see what she's got this time. Get him, Remy. There she sits, right there. That's a big raccoon. You want to shoot him? Why don't you shoot it? You have a good angle over there? Yeah, I can see him right in my light right here. All right. Oh, I'm going to shoot. He's hanging on. I'm going to shoot him one more time. There it goes. There you go, nice job. I don't hear Remy squalling, so I think you'll No, I think shake. he came out dead. I think that first shot really killed him. He just got kind of hung up in that tree. A veteran dog knows how to fight a raccoon. They'll go for the neck, but a young puppy just getting learning, they'll bite the back end and kind of drag him around. Okay. Remy dead. Well, the dog did a great job. We were able to get in here, locate it, and you put a good shot on it. You're on a piece of property where the landowner knows there are a lot of raccoons here. He's a turkey hunter and would like to see a couple of them removed. What we're wanting to do is to eradicate coons to increase our turkey population because they're destroying our nests and stuff right now. So that's what we like to, you know, to get them out of there. They are major nest raiders. Yes. Everything has its place, but everything has to be kind of kept in balance and not a whole lot of predators for raccoons. So every now and then it's good to kind of keep them in check and that helps your turkey eggs so that you have a good healthy flock. Exactly. Well, I always say at the end of every show, I always ask permission to thank the landowner. So thank you for letting us come out here today. Yes, sir, no problem. Now let's check in and see who's catching what and where in this week's fishing report. <laughs> This is Rob Rold with a fishing update for the lakes in our area. Our two main reservoirs, Rough River Lake and Nolan River Lake, are both at Winter Pool. Crappie at both reservoirs are becoming active, and anglers were catching crappie anywhere from the surface to a couple of feet deep along the shorelines and around exposed brush piles. Ohio and Green Rivers have been high and muddy over the last week or so, but keep an eye on the levels, and when they get back down and stabilize and clear up just a little bit, uh, sauger are still being caught below all the dams. So that's an update from the Northwestern District. Please remember, hypothermia sets in real quickly this time of year, so always be safe around the water, wear your life jackets, and plenty of clothes. This is Justin with your fishing report out in the Northeast. Fishing in the Northeast this time of year consists largely of sauger on the Ohio River, muskie in and below cave run, and trout in various stock locations. Muskie was starting to turn on in cave run tailwaters before the last cold spell, but I look for it to take back off with the next few days getting slightly warmer. Live baits are working as do normally, but if you prefer artificial, try using green and silver or black and silver AC shiners. There are plenty of opportunities for trout angling across the district. Greenbow and Whitehall Park are scheduled to be stocked this week. The creel limit on both of these is eight trout. If you are looking for something more scenic, where better to go than the Red River Gorge? Swift Camp Creek is this delayed harvest area. It's catch and release this time of year. Joe flies, super dupers, and power bait are always great for trout. That should do it for us in the Northeast. Good luck and be safe out there. This is Marcy Anderson with the Fishing Report for Southeast Kentucky. Winter trout stockings are currently underway on area lakes. Laurel River Lake and Beulah Lake in Jackson County were stocked at the end of January. Trout fishing on the Cumberland Tailwater can also be good right now. Trout can be caught on a variety of baits, including worms or night crawlers, corn, inline spinners, spoons, or small crankbaits. Winter time is also a good time for catching smallmouth bass on Dale Hollow, Laurel River, and Lake Cumberland. Jigs, spoons, or float and fly techniques are good options to try right now. Main Lake points and pockets are some good areas to target. With the water drawn down on Laurel River Lake, it would be a good time to mark habitat and structure that is normally underwater to help you plan for your future fishing trips. So as always, good luck and good fishing. 
Locating sauger many times of the year can be a mystery to many fishermen, but this time of year, you might want to start out by just looking below the locks and dams. So we're here in downtown Frankfort, Kentucky, here with Chino Ross with Gone Fishing Guide Service, and we're targeting musky, or excuse me, we may catch a musky, but we're targeting walleye and sauger. Chino, I know you fish all over the place, but this is something you really enjoy doing, isn't it? Well, a lot of times in the winter, you know, people have cabin fever, you know, <laughs> cold weather months, what else can you do? You're not gonna go catch any bluegill on the beds or shell cracker, so get out here and catch some cold water fish. There's not a fish that eats any better. No, that's true. They are very good table fare. And once you find them, the most important thing typically is what? Is it depth? Yeah. And it doesn't and it doesn't take long to check out, you know, an area like this. You don't have to spend all day here just hoping the fish are eventually gonna start biting. Yeah. If they're there, they're gonna bite. Yeah. And it doesn't take you long to like that. check it out. First sauger. Look at there. What was our depth there? 14, 15, 15. You need to kind of remember that. This right here is why you use a stinger hook. A lot of times you feel them when they hit this big jig. You actually, and they're, I don't know how they do it, but they'll take that minnow right off of there. You feel them and your instinct is to lift up and when you do, you snag them. Yeah, and that's exactly what happened right there. Here we go. Another sauger. Good job, man, it got deep here. I started filling my line, not hitting the bottom. I pulled out a couple feet of line. Well, probably only about eight inches straight down. Sure enough, that's where he was sitting. Got it with the stinger hook. Got him? Yep. There we go. Feels like another small one though. Definitely a sauger. Your bait didn't much more hit the bottom, did it? No, we went right by that first rock pile and that's where he was. Um, there's just something about these fish that's just, they're so much fun to catch. They're fun to catch and, and they're, they're beautiful, beautiful fish. And they're just beautiful. Nice job. I don't think mine's bigger than his. That's what I'm gonna say. What do we got going on down here? That girl thinks it's warmer than it is out here. That's cold, sister. I wouldn't be putting my feet in that. Sleeveless and barefoot. Man, that's cold. Oh, there's one. Oh, I felt him when he hit. I saw that thing bump you. Boy, he hit me twice before he grabbed a hold of it. There you go. Look how dark Look he how is. how pretty that fish is. Right out from our rock pile. He just went and hit it and hit it and hit it again, and there he was. And look at there, he bit the stinger hook. I want it. See there, just what we were talking about. He actually bit it. And it's amazing how those fish are in that spot right there. Oh, there's a bite. There you go. Is that a fish? Yep. Yeah, that's a good one. That is a better one. You need a net? I don't know, let's see him here first. Mike just uh, have him foul hook foul badly. Hook, yep. Still pretty good fish. Yeah, it's still a good fish though. There you go. Same spot, brother. I see one bigger one in there. Surely that's mine. Surely. Surely. Oh, there was a, there was a hit. You got that one. They're all about, about the same, aren't they? It might be a little bigger. Now, did he bite it? 
Look at there. Look at there. Hey, Look at that there. could be a good sign. He bit that jig. That, that fish there's got the jig in his mouth. Which... He bit the big jig. He, he hammered. I felt it. I felt him just hammer that. That could be a good sign. I love when I start seeing the, the bait in the mouth, though. That means they saw the bait, they wanted it, they aggressively hit it. There's one. Got him. Black eats. Keep him on there. Well, that's a nice that's one. That's a good sauger there. Marked up real beautiful. Nice fish. Well, I'm, I'm glad I netted him. He, he came, came off right, too, didn't he? He came right off. That, that's probably closer to a more typical size you catch down here, right? Yes. A 15, 16 inch fish. So if this were a walleye or a saw guy, it would be just about the keeper size. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Oh, that's a great one. There we go. Look at that. Did he and bite the big jig? And he's got the jig in his mouth. That's what those big ones will do. Yep. Very nice. Great fish, man. So these fish are really, really adapt to being in current. You got these markings on the top of them that when fish look down on them, they're completely camouflaged. They can't even see the fish. And the way their nose and their head is just mashed down, the current can flow right over the top of them. Their eyes are up on the top of the head, so they're obviously looking up. So they are a bottom feeding fish that's looking up and forward. Well, this was a lot of fun. Easy access, easy spot to get. We're right here in downtown Frankfurt. There's places just like this all over the state, especially around Louisville. People need to get out and give these saugers a go. That's exactly right. <laughs>Now let's see who else is out there having fun as we check out this week's ones that didn't get away. Here we have Chase Hall of Mount Washington with a couple of squirrels that he took with his 410 shotgun. And later in the year, he got this nice deer taken in LaRue County. Nice job. Here we have five-year-old Murray Hall of Mount Washington with his first squirrel ever, a big fox squirrel taken with a 410 shotgun. Here's a really nice buck taken by Emma Settles of Nelson County, Kentucky. She was hunting with her dad. It's her fourth buck ever. Congratulations. Here's Lincoln Settles with his first deer ever, a button buck that he took with a crossbow in Nelson County. Nice job. Here's Avery Settles and her first deer, a doe, that she also took in Nelson County while hunting with a crossbow. Congratulations. Here's Chloe Soder with her nice 10 point buck that was taken in Oldham County on the last day of youth season. Nice job. Here's a nice bass taken by Reese Taylor Ridnar Orwick while fishing with his pop in a farm pond in Hardin County. Nice fish. Here we have Wes Barnett with his nice 14 point buck that he took during the youth deer season in Washington County. Nice deer. Here we have traditional archer Gary Logston of Grayson County with a nice red fox that he took while bow hunting. Nice job. Check out this really nice 15 point buck taken by Dylan Davis of Lawrenceburg, Kentucky. He was hunting in Adair County with his father. That's a nice deer. Here we have 10-year-old Houston Parker with his first buck ever taken in Carroll County, Kentucky. Nice job. Here is 11-year-old Cole Smith with his first buck, an eight-pointer that had an inside spread of 18 inches taken in Madison County. Congratulations. 13-year-old Jake Witt of Science Hill, Kentucky showing us his very first deer, a 15 point buck. Nice job. Here's 10 year old Lara Kennedy with a really nice eight point buck that she took in Lewis County. Congratulations. Just a reminder, hunting and fishing license expire on February the 28th. Your new license can be purchased now. And remember, hunting and fishing on private property is a privilege. Always ask permission and thank the landowner. Until next week, I'm your host, Chad Miles, and I hope to see you in the woods or on the water. Hello, I'm Chad Miles, host of Kentucky Field, the longest running outdoor show in the nation. I've had the privilege of watching Kentucky's elk herd grow to the largest in the East and to Boone and Crockett status. As host, I've shared in some amazing elk hunts right here in Kentucky. 
This year, 700 hunting tags will be available to the public. And with Kentucky's Pick 4, you can enter in all four categories. Simply apply online by April 30th for your chance to hunt elk right here in Kentucky. 